so we're continuing our series in Daniel and this sermon today is on Daniel 7 starting the second half uh, we did the first six chapters a while ago and now we're looking at the, the seven chapters which is where things get weird if they weren't already in Daniel there are visions and dreams and prophecies and all kinds of things uh, in the first half and in the second half but the visions and the dreams get very strange so we're going to read um, chapter 7 I'm going to read verses 1 to 14 just the first half of the book uh, first half of the chapter sorry in the first year of Belshazzar king of Babylon Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed he wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on its sides, and it had three on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims, and it trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom one that will never be destroyed. So this is a, a vision that Daniel has and the division in the book, the first six chapters and the second six chapters is kind of intentional I think. And how can we say that? Because in verse 1 that we just read, we're told that this vision that Daniel had uh, came in the first year of Belshazzar. And we read about Belshazzar and his death back in chapter 5. So this vision actually happened before chapter 5 of Daniel, so between 4 and 5. And for some reason, it's been held back till the second half of the book intentionally. Maybe whoever compiled Daniel's words thought, well, you know what? In hundreds of years, people are going to preach on this book. So let's give them 
you know, let's le- ease them into it. Let's give them a gentle run in with the first six chapters. And then uh, we'll keep the difficult stuff till the end of the book so that by the time they come to preach on it, they'll have warmed up and can, can get on with the harder stuff. But I don't know if anyone who's preached any of those first six chapters of Daniel would agree that they're easier or that they're less difficult to preach on. And, and you know, you're eased gently into the book of Daniel. Back in chapter two, uh, there was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which was similar to this one, uh, a statue made of different materials and a rock came and smashed its feet. I don't know if you remember that, if you followed this series. And in that dream, the statue represented four different empires, four different kingdoms. And the rock was a kingdom that was established by God and will never be destroyed. <clears throat> That's what it says in chapter two. It's a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And if those words sound familiar to you, it's because we've just read them again in this chapter that these four beasts come out of the sea and afterwards the ancient of days will um, hand over to the son of man a, a all authority and he will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Just like in uh, chapter two, the chapter of the statue, there are different views as to which just as the different levels of the statue represented different kingdoms, there are, there are different opinions as to which beast represents which kingdom, because that's what the beasts represent here, four different empires, four different kingdoms. <coughs> um, it's generally accepted amongst those who study these things, who try and put these things together, that the first, king, the first beast in the vision is uh, the kingdom of Babylon. If you remember earlier on in, in Daniel, we've already read how King Nebuchadnezzar was humbled, you remember, uh, because of his arrogance and, and lived like a beast for so long. But when he repented, he was restored to his kingdom. And, and some say, well, obviously, that's what's going. You can see that here. There's a beast which has its wings torn off, but then is, is lifted up and turned into a, a man. That sort of mirrors Nebuchadnezzar's experience as king of Babylon. And then they go on to say, well, the second kingdom is the kingdom of, of the Medes, Darius the Mede and his kingdom that followed Babylon. And the three ribs are the th- in the, the mouth of the bear are the three empires that the Medes conquered, Babylon, Lydia and Egypt. And then the third beast is Cyrus and the, the Persian kingdom. Um, uh, <coughs> it, where you have... Four heads, the beast with four heads. You have four kings. In Daniel chapter 11, verses 2 to 7, you read about the four kings of the Persians. And, and they're the four heads of, of the third beast. And then the fourth beast, the final beast, is the Greek Empire. After Alexander the Great conquered everything and then he died and his his um, empire was split into to four. And the ten horns on this beast are the ten Seleucid kings or roughly 10 Seleucid kings it's a rounded number who ruled the region after after Alexander dies and the small horn is Antiochus Epiphanes who persecuted the Jews and declared himself to be God Uh, and that's the four empires but others say no 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 the the four beasts are, uh, are not those four I mean the first one yep the Babylonians, we accept that. The, the second one is not the Medes and the third one, the Persians. The second one are the Medes and the Persians because they were kind of the same empire, really. They they merged into one empire. And then the third beast becomes the Greek empire and it's got four heads because after Alexander's death, his empire was split into four. And then the fourth beast, the final beast, is the Roman Empire. And that makes sense, the idea of this this empire which crushes everything in its path and with teeth of iron, because that, that's more fitting to the Roman Empire than the Greek Empire, surely. And then it's during this fourth empire that God's kingdom is established, a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And we know that it was during the Roman Empire that Jesus came and established the kingdom of God. And you can't say that God's kingdom was established during the Greek rule, because although the, the, the Israel overthrew Greek rule, it was conquered again. So surely, you know, the, the beast must be, be Babylon, 
the Medes and Persians, the Greeks and Rome and not stop at the Greeks. You know, this is the discussion. This is the debate that people have. And don't even get started on who the small horn could be. I think if you uh, have a look on the Internet, there's a load of ideas out there. You just find someone you don't like and you'll probably find someone on the Internet saying, yeah, that's the, the small horn from Daniel chapter seven. Some people get very excited, get very animated when they're talking about um, the sort of these visions and, and what they mean and, and what images is which and which beast is which kingdom. And I have to say, I don't get hugely excited when I'm thinking about this, but I understand why others do. I understand why this really matters to people because it's like solving a puzzle. It's solving a mystery and it's more than that though it's not just you know interesting or fascinating um because for many people untangling some of these mysteries and showing how the bible predicts the future showing how the bible outlines the path that history is going to take is a sign of hope it's a sign that god is in control and he can be trusted because he knows how the story ends and even though we don't the fulfillment of these kind of prophecies in the Bible, seeing them unfold in history is an encouragement that God can be trusted, that God is in control. And that's why these these kind of things are there, really. That's why they're in the Bible, to encourage the readers, encourage Daniel's original audience that God is in control. Because as we've already discussed when we have thought about this book, this is a bad time for the people of God. You're an ordinary Jew. Your, your country has been destroyed. Your life has been changed and totally uh, turned over. Your religious world has been raised to the ground. And in the middle of that, the message of Daniel in, in chapter 2 and chapter 7 is clear. It's the same. It's, you know, well, right now, Things are bad for us right now. It's difficult, but it's not going to be that way forever. God is not caught off guard. He's not surprised by what's happened. He he doesn't just see what happens. He's the master of what happens as history unfolds. He's been there already. And things are we're heading towards a time when things are just not going to be better. But that God's going to establish a new kingdom. One that cannot be conquered by the bigger neighbour who comes along. A kingdom that will never be destroyed. It's clear. This message is one of hope. Hope for Daniel. Hope for Daniel's people. And Daniel's response, as if you follow on where the chapter goes next, Daniel's response to this vision and its meaning, which he's told at the end of the chapter, which we didn't read. But his response, we're told, is that he is deeply troubled. And resolves to not tell anyone. He doesn't speak about it. Possibly because of his position in the Babylonian civil service. You know, he's an important guy with authority and, and close to the the ruler. And uh, to sort of go along and say, well, you know what? This is all going to collapse. Another, another kingdom's coming. It may not be the best career move. But maybe it's just because he doesn't fully understand the vision. He... He doesn't feel confident enough to, to proclaim it because he's wise enough to think, you know, if you don't fully understand something, maybe you should keep your mouth shut. And I have, you know, read books by people who haven't realised that. I myself have said things, uh, preached sermons. I wish I'd taken Daniel's attitude and, and sort of kept my mouth shut at times. And maybe for Daniel he doesn't need to say anything it's enough for him to understand that God has given him a message that you know what Daniel I'm in control and the bad times won't last but what about now this was for Daniel and Daniel's people this is ancient history to us and we're on the other side of this we have seen presumably all four of these beasts they're there in history this is not speaking about our future is speaking about the past and is there anything to be gained by dwelling on confusing visions like this for us sort of thousands of years later isn't this just the kind of chapter 
that's a bit embarrassing, to be honest, that makes people think Christians are weird. This is the kind of stuff in the Bible that you kind of think, well, what what do I do if my, my friends ask me questions about this? So the, it's difficult. It, it's not sure. Well, the truth is these passages are still for us. They are, even though they're to Daniel in a different time, a different place about events that are in the past for us. They are still for us and we don't need to understand them any more than Daniel did. Even with the benefit of living after these things have come to pass, you see, because here's an interesting thought. It's interesting to me anyway. God didn't need to give Daniel a vision. It wouldn't have stopped God being in control of history. God doesn't need to tell us what's going to happen or or show off or say, hey, look at what I know. He doesn't need to do any of those things to to remain in control. He could just let it happen in the fullness of time. God is God, but he didn't. See, he gives us a glimpse of hope to the people under exile. And this is repeated frequently in the Old Testament, a message that God doesn't need to give. He doesn't need to do it, but he does anyway to give his people hope, to reassure them, to encourage them. These stories are recorded and passed on, not just to them, but to us, to us. And it doesn't, you know, on the face of it, make any difference to your energy bills or the cost of living or the war in Ukraine. But God still wants us to know these things. He still wants us to hear these stories, too. Why? Well, maybe because these are big picture stories. These are stories of empires rising and falling the tearing apart of the pages of history, the sky being filled with thunder as the Son of Man takes the stage. This is, you know, if you made a movie of this, this is where your budget would go, these kind of chapters. But God's bigger picture, these big picture, this, this story of empires rising and falling, of, of history unfolding on a grand stage, God's big picture always takes into account the little picture. You see, it's not enough for God that he's in charge he wants us to know that he is in charge because it matters to us it doesn't necessarily matter to God it's not going to change things if whether I know whether God's in charge or not isn't going to change whether God's in charge but it will change everything for me and that matters to God it matters to him that I know he is in control it matters to him that I know that it's all going to be okay that it's all going to work out. God doesn't tell these stories to show off or to confuse us. He wants us to have hope. That's why he shares them. And when the visions are given, when they're recorded, it's not just for the benefit of Daniel and the people of Israel in this time, in that time, it's for our benefit too. It's not for God's benefit. It's for our benefit. It's so that we too, like Daniel, can say in the words of the hymn, well, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And we can live through the rise and fall of empires without knowing what's going to happen next, without being sure what the future holds, but knowing it will be OK. It is going to be OK. These things, these these big picture things, these empires rising and falling are written out about because God thinks about us. We sit here or we read the Bible and we're thinking about these things. We're thinking about this. We're thinking about that. We may be thinking about what we've read, what we've heard. We may be thinking about what we're going to have for dinner tomorrow. We're thinking about all kinds of things. But God is thinking about us. The God who put all things under his feet is the same God that, according to Jesus, does not miss a bird falling out of the air and knows the number of hairs on your head. It's easier for some of us, you know, it takes up less space in God's memory for some of us than for others. But that's what Jesus says. That's what God is like. He knows the little picture, not just the big picture. He is thinking about you as well as thinking about these, these grand stages 
in history. So let's think a bit about Jesus for a while. Let's talk about Jesus for a while, you see, because some people think Jesus is just a great teacher. He's just a wise man. Uh, he says good, clever, beautiful things. You know, the world will be better off if we if we listen to what Jesus said. But the Christian message has never been, well, Jesus is just a good man, a wise teacher who says clever, beautiful things. The, the Christian message is that Jesus is more than that. There is a crucial difference between him and history's great philosophers and teachers. Jesus himself speaks about himself as the son of man he uses his phrase the son of man to refer to who he is in all four of the gospels we find this phrase and Stephen as he's dying in the book of Acts speaks of seeing the son of man talking about Jesus in Revelation 2 the Son of Man is a phrase that is used to refer to Jesus. And where does this phrase come from? Where does the Son of Man image come from? Chapter 7 in Daniel that we've read today. This is where it's from. That Jesus is not just a wise teacher, not just a great philosopher. He is the one who is given authority over everything. He is the one who is given the throne of the kingdom who will, that will never be destroyed. That's who Jesus is. That's what we believe as Christians. He is the highest object of worship in the world. But there's something else about Jesus that is so fantastic not just that he's the highest object of worship in the world that's a big picture thing saint augustine he once wrote i have read in plato and cicero who were philosophers from the past i've read in plato and cicero sayings that are very wise and very beautiful but i have never read in either of them come to me all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Because God doesn't have a big picture that misses the small picture. The same Jesus who we say will come on the clouds of heaven is the same Jesus who says to me, who says to you, are you weary and burdened? Come to me and I will give you rest. There's no difference to God between the heart of emperors and the heart of kings and, and your heart and my heart. He seeks them all. There are lots of things we don't know. I can say that with confidence. The things I don't know outnumber the things I do know to, you know, uh, a thousand times at least. There are lots of things that don't make sense to me, don't make sense to us, there are lots of bits of the Bible that I read that I don't understand and can't quite get my head around. And certainly as you get into the second half of Daniel, you encounter a lot of the parts of the Bible, uh, of those parts of the Bible in, in those last few chapters there. And as we go through this series in Daniel, this second half of Daniel, we're going to try and help you understand or get something from them. Um but there are many different views, many different ways to look at some of these passages. And, you know, we're just one, I'm just one person, whoever's speaking, just one person. Chapter seven is pretty tame compared to some of the things that are coming. But right now, you know what? It doesn't matter if you don't know which beast is which. You don't need to be able to identify which beast is which empire to know that one day God is going to tame every beast. And that's not just something to hold on to. That's something that God deliberately wants you to know, wants to give to you. Richard Verne Brand tells a story about his son, Mikhail. Uh, he says he, he once came to him complaining of being bored, as children do. And Richard Verne Brand's response, you know, a good, good Christian parent is, well, why don't you try thinking about God? I should try that when my parent children come to me complaining about being bored. Why don't you try thinking about God? And Mikhail, his son's response was, why should I think about God with my small head? Let him think about me with, with his big head. 
That was Mikhail's response. And as I've gone through difficult times, something that makes the difference for me, something that makes the difference for me in, in the day to day is not, you know, oh, well, I, I, at least I understand which of the four B's in Daniel 7 is which empire. No, what's made the difference for me is knowing that God is thinking of me, that God is thinking about me, remembering that I am on his mind with you. You know, that he's thinking of me with his big head. And when you find yourself losing your way in the Bible, when you find yourself losing yourself in thoughts about God, just remember, these things are in the Bible because whether we're thriving or struggling, whether we're succeeding or broken, God thinks about you.